All right, good morning. Father, we thank you for this morning. We just thank you for this fellowship, the opportunity just to come together and visit, shake hands, laugh with one another, share with one another. We thank you, Lord, uh, that you help us to break down barriers that once separated us, that we can truly be one in you. We thank you that you broke down that barrier of sin that separated us from you and the Father. And so, Lord, we thank you for the freedom that you've given to us. But may we use that freedom for you and not for ourselves. So, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would come and you would continue teaching us, shaping us, molding us, and challenging us, directing us for each step. Again, we pray that you would accept our praise, you'd accept our worship, Lord, that it would bring a smile to your face. We pray, Holy Spirit, that this word would be yours, that it truly would have power with it to bring us greater understanding, greater realization of who we are in you and what you called us to do. So we ask all this in your most holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, Candy's the one who came up with the idea of handing out uh, notes, sheets where you can take notes, because I know all of you are good note takers, but anyway. But I told her that this was kind of a complicated PowerPoint. So this is the PowerPoint with areas to take notes if you want one. So I don't know how you're going to do it. I can just toss them out like they do, yeah. footballs. Yes, please. I was waiting for that. And those are all of the uh, uh, announcements. And uh, like Cody said, work day uh, next Saturday. We've got the building sprayed, so we're making progress. And so please come if you can help in any way. Uh, we're going to do a few pictures. We had graduation Friday night. We have them all with us. Chat is no longer a high school student. Abby. And then Donna. So we were moving along. And then Stephanie kind of did this one. Whoops. I left her out. But I did have Stephanie in here. Then, this is the adventure. And you got to kind of wonder who was having more fun, <laughs> the supervisors or... You're not winning. You better get higher. Oh, there we go, yeah! Talent. God gives all of us talents. Hey, you don't know how nervous we were doing that, okay? Because we, we didn't get on film AJ's couple of tips. Oh, well, that one we should have done. These are not in any kind of order. And, of course, we always have food and some daredevils. They did have a zip line. And the Lord tells us to be like little kids. They have no fear, so I'm not sure if I'd climb that stuff or walk on those little posts. And that's Emma going up. Thank you. Can you write your name on them? Yeah. Well, Andy! <laughs> <laughs> huh? I mean, you're climbing that wall. And. Hey, <laughs> guys. I'm ready.
and save this one for the last. <laughs> This is the end. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm going with them next time. We're still looking at uh, authority and uh, some of this we've kind of covered before, but Genesis 1, 1 through 3, as I said, probably the most read uh, verses in the world because everybody starts with Genesis and at least get through the first chapter. Genesis 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters and God said. In those three verses, we see the Trinity at work. But this is where the church really differs from the world. And we talked, I talked a little bit about this, that the world that believes in, I mean, I watch National Geographic and all those, and they're going 15 billion years ago, this happened and this and that. When we believe in the Lord, then we know that he is the beginning and the end of everything. Amen. He is that authority. But if you live in the world, then it goes back billions of years, as I said, this big bang and everything else, and everything grew from that. My real problem with the Big Bang Theory is it doesn't explain anything. Because it really, that is evolution, survival of the fittest. So I've, I've mentioned this before. When you look at some of the things that we do, it has nothing to do with survival of the fittest. That cannot explain why I like to hold my wife's hand. It has nothing to do with survival. For all of us in love, when you kiss one another, you're just exchanging spit. Yeah, but we do it. Now explain that. You can't explain disappointment, anger, passion, forgiveness. You can't explain any emotion by that because they have nothing to do with survival of the fittest. So when you're looking at the world, they are giving us an explanation that explains nothing. God has the answers. So in the world, authority comes with man. You can rise it, you can grab it, you can take it. But in the kingdom, all authority, everything comes from God the Father. So when we look at this, God is there first. And then when you look at this verse, it said, The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The word for hovering literally means moving. Now the word for spirit can also be wind. And some people interpret this, that when God spoke, the wind did this. But the wind, if you live in Oklahoma, you know the wind does not hover ever. It comes and sweeps through. So you have God the Father speaking this word. You have the Holy Spirit hovering over the earth. And I believe the Holy Spirit is directing that word to accomplish everything that the Father wanted. And then we have God speaks. He speaks the word. That's Jesus Christ. Because when you come to John 1, 1 through 3, what does it say? In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. The word was God. He was with God. He is Jesus Christ. So when you look at those first three verses, you're seeing the Trinity, three in one. You see God the Father, Holy Spirit, and the word going forth. And then when we come to... Uh, John 3, it goes on and it says, the word was made flesh. So Jesus is a living word, 
and it tells us that everything that has been created was created through and by Jesus Christ. So we owe everything who we are, our creation, to Jesus. He is still that word right. being developed. If you look at science, they are, it's fascinating because every few years I'll come out and I say, whoops, the, the universe is still growing and it's still getting larger. And I've told people that when you read Genesis and God spoke his word, he never told that word to stop. That's right. That's right. It is still creating to this day. Now, if you believe in the Lord, then what that does is it, it's not an excuse for us. It gives us a peace to know that everything in all of creation is being directed by a loving father, all powerful Amen. God. Amen. So there is no such thing as a coincidence. There is no such thing as luck. It is all being orchestrated. We cannot blame everything on God because once God created this, sin entered and sin has marred the creation. And when we look at this authority, God gave authority to the devil to rule this earth because of Adam and Eve's sin. The devil has no authority on his own. When you read Job, the devil had to go to God and say, hey, can I? mess with Job, and God said, yeah, you can do this, but no more. So when we look at this and people say, well, how come this bad stuff's happening? How come this happened? It's because of sin, not because of God. But in our lives, when we do not follow God, we give the devil authority in our lives That's to right. mess with us. That's right. We have opened the door in this country to the devil. And people are saying, well, why doesn't God stop it? And God's saying, you're my instruments on this earth. Why aren't you stopping it? And we're seeing things that are just multiplying so fast. We're seeing sin grow like ever. We're becoming like Israel of the old where everybody is doing what's right in their own eyes. But when we find things going wrong, we want someone to blame except for ourselves. I'm an authority. Life goes bad. I'm going to blame someone else. That's because we won't take responsibility. So when God says, I'm going to extend authority to my church, the church has to accept responsibility. I truly believe that this country is in the shape it's in because the church has not really been the church because a fairly decent percentage voted for our present administration. And with that, brought in the, the, the LGBTQ deal. We brought in uh, abortion on demand. We, brought, we opened the door to all of that. But I told Carol before, when you read Jesus' words, they said, when is the end coming? He said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, there are going to be birth pains. You know what he said? People are going to become lovers of themselves, and lawlessness will grow. We're seeing lawlessness in this country. It's not because we as the church are not doing what we're supposed to. That's the reality of our world. We are not going to change it. Isn't that good news? It is because God is in control. But his church is not going to be held helpless. We will not be able to stop this end time movement toward destruction, but we will be a brighter, brighter light. And if with our authority, we will still save people for Jesus Christ. Right. We cannot overturn what has already happened in the eyes of God. It's going to get worse. They're going to do it. Lawlessness is going to spread. They're going to become lovers themselves. People in the church are going to want their ears tickled, which means they're going to go after doctrines that make themselves feel good and doesn't challenge. And he said, that's just going to grow. But he said, don't worry about it, because that's not the end. <laughs> but he said, at the same time, my spirit's going to grow. My church is going to be pruned. My church is going to rise up. My bride. His church has unbelievable authority as parts of that body, you and I have authority, right. but we need to understand what that means and what we are to do with it. So I want us to look at Moses. When you look at the Old Testament, God took his authority in the form of the Holy Spirit and he dropped it on people for a specific purpose. When you look at uh, uh, Noah, he said, Noah, you've got authority to build this boat. Now, did you ever wonder what it's like 
to spend months and months and months on an ark with every animal under the world, would some of them want to kill you? Noah had authority over those animals. He said, you do that. They're not going to mess with you. They're not going to cause a problem. You have authority. But as soon as it's done, the authority is, is gone. Uh, when you look at, uh, uh, there's a prophet, there's a story in there where Jeroboam is king and he's an evil king. And God <laughs> picks this man and says, you have authority. I want you to go to Jeroboam and tell him he is in serious, serious trouble. He tells the prophet, you're going to go this way, but you're going to come back a different way. So for that moment, God gives him authority to deliver one word to Jeroboam. His problem? He came back the same way. He gets eaten by a lion. We have responsibility to our Lord. That's right. Amen. And then when you look at uh, uh, King Saul, he had that authority to prophesy one time. And so when we do this, we realize that God in the Old Testament, gave this person authority for one particular purpose. When you look at Moses, <laughs> I've never tended sheep, but you really don't have to have much authority to tend sheep because from what I understand, sheep are pretty dumb animals. Don't be offensive, but Jesus calls us sheep. <laughs> and when you look at what we've done to this world and to each other, we're pretty dumb. So he says, Moses had no authority when he, for 40 years when he's out there tending sheep. And all of a sudden, he comes up on this burning bush. And he goes, hey, I'm going to go over here. Goes to the burning bush. Burning bush says, go to Pharaoh. God gives him authority over Pharaoh for that particular purpose. God gives him authority over the entire nation of Israel for 40 years until they come into the promised land. Right. He did not have it before. And when he passed on, that authority was taken and given to Joshua. So in the Old Testament, only certain people received the Spirit of God with authority for a particular purpose, not everybody. Now, you want to know what's different for you and me? Every one of us receives the same Spirit. Every one of us is filled with the same power. Right. Every one of us is given the same authority. That's right. And so when you look at this, and this is uh, one of the things about Moses. It said, Moses' father-in-law replied, because this is where Moses is spending all day listening to people. He says, what you're doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear themselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring very difficult cases to you. The simple cases they can decide themselves, that will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you'll be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. So this is what authority looked like in the Old Testament. God picks Moses and gives him authority. He tells Moses, you are going to be like God to these people. What you say is the word I give, and they will obey. So God gives Moses this authority. Now he's being strapped. And so now, and this is important when you read it. His father-in-law says you should do this if God commands it. You and I cannot give our authority, God's authority that's in us, to anybody else unless God allows it. So Moses says, all right, we'll pick them. So one person's taking care of thousands, another one hundreds, another 50, and another tens. Everyone receives the same authority, but not everyone receives the same responsibility. Now, how would you feel if your good friend is chosen by Moses and anointed, you're over a thousand, and then points at you and said, you're tens? We do not compare that. The authority is the same. The sphere is different. 
That's where it comes with the talent. Some of us have one talent. Some will have five. Some will have ten. Some will be given greater authority or greater sphere to use that authority. But whether you are over ten people or over a million, it's the same authority that comes from God. It's just that God says your sphere is smaller. It does not make us different. It doesn't make us insignificant. That's right. It just means that in that place, you and I have authority. So God's authority comes from the top. But as soon as they enter the promised land, that authority is lifted. They are no longer the same judges. They don't need it. And so here we have the authority coming and going. And then you have the same authority, same abilities, same responsibilities. Now, I will tell you, one of the things I think has harmed the church for the last 100 or 200, 300 years is that the church taught the people that the priest was a direct authority from God and that person was responsible for everything. So when we come to major denominations, we expect the pastor to do everything. If you think that of me, you are in for a real big surprise. That it's true, but you can laugh. Because if you've been around very long, I'll forget more things than you'll ever remember. I am not good at visiting. I am not good at a lot of things, but I can do what God has given me authority to do. And so we have to look at the church the same way God directed Moses. You've got this person up here who then gives authority to others, who gives authority to others. So we all share the same authority but we all have different responsibilities. But your authority is no different than mine. My authority is no different than the greatest evangelist on the face of the earth. That's right. That's right. But we have to use it. So when we come to this, we have the same responsibilities. Moses is not only responsible to God, he's responsible to everybody under him. I am responsible... For delivering God's word to you. But I'm also responsible to see that everyone is getting fed. That we have things going. So I'm responsible to those I am over. But I'm also responsible to one. So having authority doesn't mean we sit around doing whatever we want. It means we better pay very close attention to the one over us. So that we can adequately serve those under us. That's right. Our authority is given to serve not to rule. But at the same time, we do rule over this earth. We have authority over the darkness. We have authority over our lives. We have authority to declare. We have authority to bless and to curse. Be careful, though. You don't want to bless the wrong person, and you surely don't want to curse the wrong person. But I shared it in Sunday school class. We have authority. And I have tried for years to take authority over chiggers. <laughs> if you read... Exodus, God told the flies not to go into Goshen, and they didn't. I said, well, then you can tell these chiggers, leave my yard alone. They, oh, I don't know if you've ever been bitten by chiggers. Oh, my goodness, those are the worst things in the world. Second is poison ivy. So far, I have not had authority over chiggers. I'm still working on it. And so when we look at this, we come to Jesus. In John 10, 29 through 30, Jesus says, My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. When Jesus first comes, he says, The Father and I are one. Which means that God's authority is Jesus' authority. They are equal, just like they were at the beginning. And so he said, If you belong to me, you belong to the Father. And he says, when I give my authority to someone else, he said, if you welcome this person in my name, you're welcoming me and you're welcoming the Father because you cannot separate authority. So the way we treat the person on the street is the same way we are treating Jesus Christ. That's why he says, whatever you do, do it as unto me. Because your authority goes up the chain as well as down. And then when you look at John 1, 1 through 3, we read it before, the word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. But now when you come to John 1, 14, 
the word became flesh. Jesus Christ is the living word in a earthly body. He is the word God spoke from the beginning that is still creating in the flesh. Now, if that doesn't boggle your mind, well, then you're smarter than I am because I can't grasp it, but I believe it. And he says, everything we've seen is glory. It's the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace. He's equal to God. When Jesus Christ becomes flesh, he loses that authority. He is fully man, fully God, but as fully human, he has no more authority than you and I when we start out. So as Jesus is walking this earth, he has no authority. People go, what did he do when he was growing up? He was a little kid growing up. He had no authority. And so when you look at this, what God is doing, he is giving us a picture. He is giving us an idea of how he assigns authority. When he chose to walk this way, and we're going to get to the fact that he said, I have all authority to do with my life as I want. Jesus agreed to do that. He's giving up a relationship with his father. He's still his father, but not equal. He's going to be uh, tempted just like you and I, hurt, mistreated, and he will walk this earth with no authority. And he did all that for you and me. But then, whoops. In uh, Matthew 3.16, I've got to pay attention to my notes. I'm not sure where I am. It says, after Jesus was baptized, what happened? He comes out of the water. The heavens open up. A dove descends, which is the Holy Spirit, and lands on him. God the Father says, this is my son in whom I'm pleased. That's the Trinity. God's in heaven speaking. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove, and Jesus is the recipient. So what happened then? Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now I want to tell you, there is still a lot of controversy in the church that you do not need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I am going to tell you I disagree. You need to decide on your own. Jesus was baptized. How many of you believe that Jesus was saved? He had to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit to begin his ministry because up to that time, Jesus had done nothing extraordinary. Right. Now he has been given the authority in a limited sense to do his ministry. What did he do with the authority? Whatever he saw his father doing, he did. That's right. He said, so I have authority, but I'm not going to use it for myself. I didn't know what time. Oh, I shouldn't have looked because we're on a roll. And so there is the baptism, and it's a baptism of authority, of power. Now Jesus begins to do miracles. Now he begins to teach. Now he starts causing trouble. You know what happens when God gives you authority and you accept it? You are going to be a thorn in the side to this world, and they will not like you. You are not going to be invited to parties because you are going to be a bright light in the darkness that's going to shine and show everybody else's sin and they don't want you. Now, do you see why a lot of people refuse the authority of God? Because I want to fit in. And God says, no, you will not fit in. Now we come to the end. Jesus is given a choice. He says, I have authority. When he chose to accept God's cup of suffering, remember in the garden, he said, God, take this from me, but your will, not mine. You and I can always ignore God. You and I can tell him no anytime we want to. Right. But we have a responsibility. When he suffered, when he said, I will do this, when he was beaten, spit upon, whipped, and cursed when he climbed back up on that cross he became sin though he had never sinned what that means literally when he it said he didn't become like one who sinned he became sin itself take every sin in the world take the most disgusting terrible sin you can think of 
And Jesus became that sin. What did he do with his authority? What the Father wanted him to do. There's a price to pay. So when God looked at him on the cross and Jesus is crying out, why, oh, why have you forsaken me? God hasn't departed him. God cannot look on sin. Jesus Christ is separated. Where does he go? Three days he goes into hell fighting for you and me to take the keys of death and hell. And he says, now, my authority, no one who accepts me will ever die eternally and you will never see hell. So as he's look, God is looking at Jesus on this cross, he is the son of God. He is that bright light. He is the bright morning star. But then all of a sudden, God takes the sin and puts it on him. When Jesus looks at the crowd, do you know who he sees? He sees you and me clothed in white. I'm not in those dirty clothes anymore. I'm not covered in that sin. I don't carry it with me anymore. He is my sin. He's on that cross with that authority, and he takes it all on him, but he looks out here and he says, I am going to make you righteous. When he rises again, that's what we see here. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to you. When he rises again, God restores him. He is given all authority in heaven and on earth. He is now restored to his position as the son of the living God. Amen. Amen. Now, what does he do with it? And we've done this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. That word go means I have given every one of you he says, my authority, go and do these things that I did. What's the first thing he says? Preach the gospel. The word for preach simply means open your mouth and tell people the truth. Amen. Amen. The world doesn't hesitate to tell you these lies. The world doesn't hesitate to tell you that there are 22 different sexes. I'm not talking about arguing. I'm saying, look, I know Jesus, and I want to tell you the truth. Men and women... Why do we have all this controversy? It's called sin. That's right. God did not create people sinful. Sin has affected us. But he says, I am going to give you authority to speak. When you stand up, your word will have the power of God behind it, while theirs has nothing. Do you believe it? That's why we're all so eager. Give me the chance, God, I'm going to stand up. No, we're sitting there going, I'm not going to say anything. I sure hope somebody in this room stands up. Because then when somebody else does, then we go, thank you for saving me. That's not authority. That's being chicken. <laughs> but we don't pick up our authority and hold up a sign and say, and you're going to hell in a handbasket because you won't accept. That's not authority. But you have authority to speak a truth that will dissolve darkness, touch lives, and change people. Amen. You want to know what? Even if I don't believe it, it's true. That's true. Amen. The church, I believe, has become ineffective, not in a bad way. Not that we're not doing good. But we have not seen that church of Acts, because we don't believe we really have authority to do those things. Those are for special people. Guess what? You're special. You are special to God. Amen. So when he says go, he says, I've given you my authority. Look what he tells you to do. Preach. Make disciples. Teach people. Get into fellowship. Get into Bible studies. Let's talk to each other. Let's challenge each other. Let's sharpen each other. And then he says, go out when you see them, baptize them. Pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit the same thing you do. Equip them. Don't just get them saved, write them a certificate, and send them home. He said, I'm giving you authority to do that. I'm not sure where we are. We'll see what's on the next slide. Oh, and then Acts 19. We'll skip over here. It says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? 
They answered, no, we've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Question, when you were first saved, did you know who the Holy Spirit was? Or did they tell you, you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. You are good. You will never die. You're going to spend eternity with Jesus Christ. Did you know there was a Holy Spirit? Oh, yeah. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do you know who he is? No one told me anything about it. I'm saved. I just sat around feeling good for myself. They said, we didn't even know there was one. And look what he says. He said, we need to change that. He didn't say, do you want him? He said, you need him. Right. And it says, he says, no, Paul says, then what, what baptism did you receive? And they replied, John's, which is the baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And he goes on. He says, on hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were 12. That's when the power comes. When you have the authority of the Lord, when the Spirit comes on you, then you have authority to lay hands on others and spread that authority. It's the same authority, but we have to believe it. Now, read it for yourself. Look at the scriptures. Jesus was baptized twice. These people are baptized twice. Now, I don't know about you, but when you take the 11 disciples, well, 12 when they replace them with Matthias, or the 11, because there's just 11 now, in the upper room, those men were saved. I don't know about you, but they went through that. Jesus forgave them. They were in the upper room. God tells them the way. They witnessed him risen. And it says that when he came into that room with them through the locked door, he breathed on them, opened their minds. What did he tell them to do? You go and you wait. And when the Holy Spirit in power falls on him, he said, now go and change the world. And they changed the world. That's right. 120 That's right. people changed the world. They needed two baptisms. Yes, when you are baptized, when you are saved, you receive the Holy Spirit who will guide us and teach us and keep us straightened. That's not the power. You want the power? We need to seek it. With that authority and power comes more responsibility. That's right. Amen. And then Jesus said, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. There's so much cost for you. It's been over the years. It's one reason the Jews have been persecuted. Everybody says Jews killed Jesus. Jesus said, I want to tell you something. Nobody touches me unless I give you authority. Right. No one took my life. I have the authority to lay it down, and I've got authority to pick it up. Now, you want to know what? So do you. You have the authority. No one's going to make you. You have authority to lay your life down at the feet of Jesus. He does. That's called surrendering. No one's going to make you. You have that authority over your life. You have the same authority to lift it back up. We can either take it back up and go back in the world, or we can tell Jesus, you do it. He says, this is the authority that my Father has given to each of us. So I want us to look at this. His pictures are pretty good. And it took me a long time to make this so that all everything appeared at the same time. So you need to appreciate this. If you don't appreciate the message, and at least appreciate the PowerPoint. In the beginning, and I don't have the Holy Spirit here coming here, you have God and Jesus, and they are equals. I and the Father are one. At the beginning, God speaks. Jesus is the one who is there to become flesh. And we said, when he became flesh, there is no authority passing from God to Jesus. He becomes just like you and me. He suffers like this. He struggles like us, but he has no more authority than you and I. When he comes into his ministry, when it's time for him to meet John the Baptist, that is when the Holy Spirit comes on him, and this is when Jesus' ministry starts. Now he goes out. Now he starts to preach. Now he starts to heal. Now he starts to deliver. Now, not before. What did he do for the first 30 years? 
lived a life like you and me, but perfect. But he did not go around here. He wasn't a little kid that raised up his playmates when they broke their leg and said, don't worry about it, I got it. Here, stand up in the name. He didn't do that. But now he does. And Jesus said, what do I do with this authority? I only do what my father does, and I only speak what my father speaks. Because of that, he used his authority for the right reason. The authority he gives us is not to build up a church. Our authority is to go out and do what God is doing in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's when he uses that authority to do it. And he says, I will die for you. And he says, this is what it really means. You might die for a righteous person. I'm going to die for the unrighteous. That's his authority. He is on the cross, and they're laughing at him. They said, man, if you're the son of God, then come down from there. And he's going, I am the son of God, and I choose not to. That's power. That's authority. That's right. Amen. To me, the greatest example of Jesus' power is when he's standing before Pilate, and the crowd's yelling, crucify him and crucify him, and he can call down legions of angels, and he keeps his mouth shut. That's power. That's right. I don't know about you, but I probably would have called down my angel and said, get him. But he kept his mouth. That's power to have it and not use it for your purposes. That's right. Amen. And so he climbs on the cross. That's why we go back to that, that, that Easter message. Jesus' death and resurrection is one point in our lives. That's when life gets interesting. That's when life gets challenging. Because he says, because of that, now I have opened you up to receive what I have received. When he rises, that's when God returns the authority. Now, Jesus is our authority, all authority in heaven and on earth. We have authority when he does it. We have authority over the principalities. We have authority on this earth. Now, what does he do with this authority? He just starts giving it out. And I don't have enough room for everybody, so if your name's not listed, do not be upset. That's the same authority that he has, and he gives it to every one of us. But there is a catch, I believe. I know you can't see it behind there, but you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? That means I've got to say, you know what? I want your authority, and I will use it for you. And when you do that, you'll be filled with the power to do the impossible, but you're also going to be a sore spot to the world, and you will be persecuted. You cannot have the authority if you will not use it. That's right. Our government has spent like $20 billion to put charging stations all over the United States. I don't care. You know why? I don't have an electric vehicle and I won't buy one until someone makes me. So to me, they're useless because I will not hook into them. Jesus says, I'm not going to give you my authority if you will not use it. But he said, if you believe me, if you will come and if you will seek it, and I'm not sure why we hesitate. There's all kinds of lies about it. There's all kinds of stuff about it that if you ask for this, you're going to get the devil. You're going to do this. No, 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 no. But people say, well, I don't want to come forward. I don't want to admit I don't have him. Well, I want to tell you something. Nobody starts with this. Everybody receives it who seeks it. And when you do, now the church becomes the church. Now the church. You want to know how we're going to tell the real church from the church that thinks it's a church, this church will have no power. They will have influence in the world, but they will have no power. This little church will be filled with the power of God. Amen. You have the authority at your fingertips. We just need to seek it. If you have received it, then use it. How? To serve others, to touch lives, to speak the truth, 
to challenge one another. We are here to keep each other accountable. We're here to sharpen one another. We are here to help one another grow, and we are here to go out. And you want to, if we have problems in our school, take authority over it. That's right. If you don't like the decisions our school board or our city mayor is doing, then take authority. That doesn't mean go out and curse them and get rid of them. It means pray for them. Declare that the enemy's influence is going to stop. Declare that the lies that our children are hearing will not touch their ears. They'll know the truth. We got anybody here who's hurting in any way? We got somebody still going to be healed from cancer? Anybody here in Oklahoma have allergies? And I don't know about you, but this is another crazy thing in the church. Well, I'm not going to go over and ask you to pray for allergies when this person's being prayer. Like it's like God only has so much for He has a hierarchy. Whoops, He does not. You know what? Same power to heal them both. That's right, Amen. But we say, okay, do you need anything? Come forward, and we just sit there. He says, you got authority to pray for each other. you got authority. But for us to be able to use that authority with one another, we've got to be willing to ask for help. We've got to be willing to say, you know what? I need something. Now, I don't know about you, but the minute I wake up, I'm telling God what I need. Okay? I've got aches and pains. I've got this. We've got to face that. And he says, when you ask, people with authority are going to pray for you. The church is going to rise up in power. You have the authority right before you. That's true. Amen. When we looked at the vision, and that vision, we talked about people opening the doors and people flying. That's people going in the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you need anything, come and ask. Stop me in the middle of this and say, man, would you stop talking and just pray for me? Oh, but we don't do that in church? Yeah, that's what we do in church. That's right, amen. You need prayer? Come and we'll pray for you. You don't need prayer? Then come and pray for me. I need it. If everything is going well, then give God the praise and let people know. Do you have a praise report? Every one of us has a praise report. I tell you, I am absolutely amazed. We plant a garden. I can take a seed that's so small you can't see it. And you want to know what? It's becoming a huge plant that I'm going to feed off of the entire summer. And I'm going, God, that's pretty amazing. He says, you plant, you water, I make it grow. So when you see that grow, that's God. I thank him for that. I also pray that the deer will leave it alone. Thank you for listening. We have the authority to speak the truth. We are history makers simply because we are kingdom people. We are living in a most historic time. Amen. If they're still around people 100 years from now, we're going to look back on this and say, can you believe what they did? But when you're living through it, but we are. So if you need prayer, if you're not feeling well, if you've got a problem, the elders are here, just come up there and say, hey, I need help. Pray for our building. Pray for this church. Pray for this nation. Because you have authority to pray and touch the heart of God. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have all authority, that you are the creator. You are the beginning and end of everything. You have chosen to share your authority with us in earthen vessels, knowing that we are going to stumble, we're going to make mistakes, we're going to disappoint you, but you will never remove your anointing from us. You will love us, you'll lift us up, you will correct us, and we will keep going. You love us so much that in these earthen bodies, you have made us temples of your Holy Spirit, and you will pour into us your spirit, not so we can feel good about ourselves, but so we can go into the world like you said and teach people your word, make disciples, 
strengthen one another. And so, Lord, I thank you for every person here, to every person who's listening. And I pray, Lord, that if we do not know you personally, we would not hesitate. If we don't know if we've received the baptism, then, Lord, let us come forth and say, you know what, I want this. And let us be filled with the authority, and then let us go into this world and use it for your purposes and for your glory. Again, we pray for every family, every mother. We pray, Lord, that in this day, we will go forth in your name, that you will watch over us, you will bring us back, and we pray that that building will be finished, not for our glory, but for yours, and it will be used for your purpose and your purpose only. We ask this in your most holy name. Amen. God bless you. If you need prayer, we're here.